So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leonardo Favario from uh, Pago Pia. I'm the head of the Open Source Program Office. And uh, today I'm going to quickly talk to you about um, a set of things that I think could be of interest for someone. I mean, it could be near someone in some way and can be far away from some other experience, but I think that maybe we can uh, discuss about some of these topics together. Um, why am I saying this? Because our company called Pagopia is in, inserted inside an ecosystem which is the Italian government. Okay, so the Italian government has some frameworks and works in a, such a way so that maybe you will see that you know some of the findings and some of the discoveries that we're going through here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to tell you in, in a minute. <laughs> and so anyway, this is the agenda for today. We're going to have a little bit of background on the legislative framework. And we're going to talk about Pagopia, which is, you know, the name doesn't tell a lot, as, as you can say. So we're going to explain a little bit in details what the company does. And then we will see some of the findings that uh, in this first year of operation as an open source program office, we um, actually discovered. So first and foremost, um, a little bit of framework, a little bit of uh, norms. In Italy, starting, let's say, 20 years ago, 25, 26, um, the legislators started to think about a way to make software acquisition inside the government, so inside every public administration, a little bit more efficient. So they started to say, okay, when every time uh, a new administration acquires a piece of software or develops a software from scratch, it has to do so in a way that makes it possible for other administration to reuse it. Okay, they started to think about the terms reuse. And um, time passed and this strategy didn't really take place, didn't really work. And um, 10 years later, let's say around 2016, uh, the Prime Minister's office decided to create a team inside uh, the government to study for an advancement of this law. And uh, what actually came out after this um, little study group, study focus session, was a way to treat public administration software in the same way as we treat normal software, right? At the end, we're talking about software, we're not talking about strange um, animals. So what happened was that in 2016, the legislator, legislator started to change the primary law, introduced a new law, which is called a Code for Digital Administration, that was basically saying, okay, from now on, if you're a public administrator and you d develop some piece of new software, you have to release it as open source, free and open source, with an OSI approved license. So at that moment in time, stuff started to change, right? Because we're saying basically that, that it's not labeled as public administration software, but it's just free and open source software is everything we are used to uh, handle. So uh, this started a little bit of movements inside the ecosystem. And one of the things that actually sparked from that moment was the creation of this startup, let's call it that way. Um, it's called Pago Pia which has a particular nature since it is 100% owned by the Italian Ministry of Economy and Finance. So it's a public uh, company. The role of the company is to build what we call the digital interconnected enabling platforms. And we will give some example of this so that you understand exactly what this is all about. So basically the company uh, pro, um, provides software for the local and central government, specifically the national central government. But then we also have some in-house software, so we provide software and we build it with our, with our own financial resources. Let's give some examples of those um, enabling platforms. Um, some of them are like uh, mobile handled uh, applications that more than 40 million Italians actually downloaded, and most of them are using the, this application on a daily basis, which is a way to exchange information and actually 
putting the citizen at the center. So you're, you as a citizen are not asking for information to your uh, public administration, but the administration is reaching you. Other ones are like the payment system. So pago in, in Italian means pay, right? So the payment system that is right nowadays mandatory for all public administrations to use is called PagoPA and it's developed by the company. And then we have many other platforms like the National Digital Interoperability one, and we are inside the consortium to build the European Digital Identity Wallet. So you see, these are sort of platforms that I would define as instrumental for the user. And what I mean by that, that usually the citizen doesn't even know that it's using our platform because um, they are integrated through APIs with the public service. So as you can see over here, it's a quick explanation of what a normal user end-to-end -end flow works. So from the very top, the citizen has to access the public administration, has to access some sort of public digital service. So what happens under the hood is that usually the citizen accesses some sort of public service through a mobile device, through a web application, which is not developed by the administration. Keep in mind that we have more than 23,000 public administrations in Italy. Most of them, the vast majority of them, don't have the um, scale to own an IT department inside. So, of course, they have to rely and exploit um, third-party service providers. So, SMEs are really crucial here. It's small and medium enterprises in Italy are crucial so that they work, they do work commissioned by public administration so that um, they enable the digital transformation and the digital access for the citizen. You see, in this graph over here, I put Pagopia at, at the very center, so in the middle of the graph, because again, the public service has to interoperate, so has to establish a communication channel, usually through REST APIs, with our platforms, right? The, the interconnected enabling platform I was telling you before. And then from the other side, Pagopia has to establish, uh, I would call it, a human-to-human -human, uh, communication, full duplex communication channel with the small and medium enterprises so that those partners are really key for us so that we can implement a better digital transformation. So just a few examples about this. I, kept, I picked two examples of products we are serving. The first one is application EO, as I told you before, downloaded more than 40 million times. And... Um, Inside the application nowadays, when a citizen uh, accesses the application, it will, uh, he or she will find more than 140,000 services that are provided by 11,000 public administration. But keep in mind this net number. The number of small meter enterprises that are helping the administration is like around 50. So there is an incredible uh, ratio here. So 11,000 served by more than 50, 50 to 60 SMEs. And this number is even more interesting right now, uh, right here in the sample, uh, second example for Pago PA, where there are 19,000 public administrations served by around 80 small, medium enterprises. What does it mean is that as, as Pago PA, we really have to take into consideration and really care about the interaction with these small, medium enterprises, because if we miscommunicate or we miss a communication um, and we, we are not able to really uh, react to what uh, a question or um, a request for a feature from a, a medium or small medium enterprise is, then we're not going to miss one, one public administration. We're going to miss many of them, potentially thousands of them, and then create a disservice for a lot of people, a lot of citizens. Now, this was just an introduction of our operation just to set the ground so that you understand where are we working, which is the ecosystem, the Italian uh, government ecosystem. Now, everyone in this venue or <laughs> every people I talk with um, about this situation, they tell me, well, that's okay, but coming from maybe a free and open source software community, that's not so scary, right? You have to handle communication with different people, with different providers, different vendors, but that's something you can do. So actually, um, five years ago, when Pagopia was created, we decided to keep this approach. So you have an open approach, not just open source, but also, you know, you do, doing some code design, some code development, enabling a community of practice. So involving as much as possible the, um, the system integrators and the, make them our partners. 
Of course, as much you have to keep in mind that five years ago, um, the company had five people. Now, five years after, we're around 450 people going possibly to 500. So it's a huge, you know, um, it's a 110, 100x uh, expansion. So in few years' time, so just in five years. So this means that when you are in a very startup phase, you start to do a lot of things. Um, immediately, we reached more than 1,000 repositories out there on our uh, organization. So, you know, so stuff started to, to happen, but we eventually understood that uh, we needed a little bit of strategy on top of the way we were handling the open source world. And that's how we came uh, to realization that we needed an open source program office. Now, open source program office is a very good set of words, but uh, everyone, I guess, also in this uh, venue has its own definition of it. I mean, we saw also this morning and these days that there are some um, efforts in order to try to define a little bit better what an OSPO should be and what which should be also the people inside OSPO. But to me, it's still a work in progress and it's still something that we are dealing with on a daily basis. So, for example, over here, I just tried to, you see, I'm not a designer, sorry for that, but um, that's my idea of Venn diagram where you see four main uh, skill set from one side, which inside our company are actually departments. So we get tech, we get legal, community, communication, management. OSPO stays at the crossroad of them, right? In the very mi middle. Because you actually, when you think about an OSPO, you think about something that has to be multidisciplinary by default, right? By design, something that has to involve as many colleagues as possible. So one of the first issue, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, uh, is positioning the OSPO inside the organization chart. Where do you put it? And if you check the literature, um, there are many sources, like there's, there's there are books, there are blog posts and so on, and they try to define OSPOs like, okay, you need a community OSPO, or you need a compliance OSPO, a marketing OSPO, whatever. And every time they label an OSPO, they say, okay, this OSPO has to be set inside the office for the CTO. This marketing OSPO has to be set inside the marketing department. Okay, the point is that we all we kind of need all those um, skill set in one single place, so the question remains where to put it when you start. So we will see how our iteration over it and how we, we are kind of moving our OSPO inside the organization and see effectively where should be going next. So the idea of the OSPO, of course, is um, that also right now it's a one-man band and you have the band in front of you, right? So it's, um, it's something that has to, I mean, the scale, we should take that into consideration. So the OSPO, it started as a, I call it a one-stop shop, a place where the, uh, every colleague could just, you know, pop off and say, hey, I need something, could you help me? It's not an oracle. It's not something that solves every issue you have or every possible issue that a team de delivering a product has, because it cannot scale that way, but it's something that has to work asynchronously. I developed a, an, a framework to deal with this situation and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more later on. So first of all, when the company decides to set up an OSPO, uh, the first main task is to define a strategy, right? So again, as I said, for OSPO, there are many flavors, many possibilities. I think the same happens for strategy, especially, especially when you're dealing with open source strategy. So what is it? Do we have a standard? Do we have a definition? I'm not that sure. So we came up with our own flavor of it, of course, trying to follow what the path of other um, before us did. It. So in order to define a strategy, we set some preliminary steps and then an implementation phase. The first question I asked myself was, okay, a strategy means that we have to move from where are we right now and maybe go backwards or forward who knows but we have to set some sort of goal right so imagine i don't know having a map and with the gps you know where you are right now and then you have another pin and you have to 
put the pin somewhere on the map. And that's the journey. And uh, maybe the distance is not in kilometers in that way, but it's like effort that the, the company has to put in. And then what you get during the journey is a higher level of maturity. So I, we started iterating over this idea of maturity, right? And we studied, we studied literature, blog posts, following also some foundations work and, and groups. And we found that there were, and there still are right now, some open source maturity models out there. And what is it? It's like a way to say, okay, um, there are steps in the history and, uh, of a company where you start with a low level of maturity in subject X. In this, in this case, it's open source. And then eventually, if you work through um, those steps in a correct way, following a correct strategy, you will increase the maturity level, right? So that seems like a, a good approach. And we said, okay, let's try to define a um, maturity model for concerns open source for our company. And then of course, once you have the maturity model in place, you have to do an analysis. You have to say, okay, where am I right now in this maturity ladder? I am right here or I'm right there, right? So we did it and we discovered many things in the process. Of course, now that you know where you are and you know where you want to go, you need something, right? That's the strategy. So in our mind, the strategy was actually, again, fixing the challenge. So having an overall goal that sets some objectives. Then we needed a methodology. The strategy needs to tell you how to get there. And um, for us, in our company, we define this, the methodology as a set of guiding policies, something that guides you through the journey, guides you through the way so that you can actually concretely do some actions, coordinated actions. And in that way, you reach specific objectives. So again, challenge, methods, and actions. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the um, free and open source software maturity model that we came up with. Um, this five steps, you may have kind of seen them in other models around the web. And these are kind of tweaked on top of our needs, on, on the company need. So for example, see step number one, which is use, become better users. I'm, I'm saying better because we were actually already using an open source approach. As I told you before, as the free and open source approach was the natural way to approach a, a community of practice model. So we didn't have to win a huge inertia that um, many companies have to face when they start this free and open source um, world. Because maybe if you come from a very proprietary mindset, you really have to do a lot of job just to arrive to step number one. For us, it was easy because we were already users, but we would like to become better users. So that's something, you know, regarding compliance, regarding knowing what a license is, you know, knowing what inbound licenses are and what outbound licenses are, the compatibility matrix and so on, working on the tool chain and so on. So once you do step number one, you're ready, probably you reach the maturity level so you can basically start step number two, which is repeat. Meaning that everywhere on all your thousand, two thousand, whatever repositories you have, you are able to be compliant from the very beginning. So compliant by design. And then every project that starts from scratch, that has to be compliant by design. Once you're ready, you did step one and two, you may try to get inside step number three, which is basically contributing. Contributing, which means a lot of things. And, and, and we, in our discovery phases, interviewing also many stakeholders inside the company, outside like community members, we understood that there's not one single way to do that. Maybe straightforward for you, but it is not, especially for other, you know, for many non-technical people or, or people and colleagues that never faced the open source ecosystem. So contributing has a, a lot of fashion and we really have to go on a case by case basis to analyze each of them and understand if it's a financial contributor, if it's um, code contribution, if it's a community contribution, you know, there are many ways to do so. And then one, two, three, when they're ready, we're 
good to go to step four and five, which are the ones that try to get also non-technical people on board. So, you know, co-creation means a running co-design workshop, means working with designers, working with marketing, working with uh, at the top management. And then eventually, when you're doing everything the way you should, you are set to become a sort of role model for the ecosystem. So you're ready for being a, um, again, a player that knows what it's doing inside the ecosystem. Again, you may say, okay, these are good words, but how do you implement it, right? A strategy needs concrete actions. So for each one of those, and I said, I, I had a little bit summary over there, even if you don't read it, it's just the, the idea of saying, okay, each of these steps provide an added value to the company, right? But then they must have concrete objectives and key results. So when the company is able to provide those results, so reach the objective, that's the moment when you're reaching that level of maturity, right? So you're saying, okay, now I'm ready to move from one step to the, to the other one. Now we have the maturity model in place. We're ready to test it. Let, run some discovery inside our company, outside, run some uh, workshops. And uh, there were interesting findings. Uh, at least I summarized three of them. First one, it was clear that our strategy back in the day needed a strategy, right? So it was not clear where we were going for what concerned free and open source software, which is good because it means that creating an OSPO, defining a task to create a new free and open source software strategy is the way to go. But then we discovered that many actions were already taken by colleagues, right? So imagine <coughs> colleagues are like uh, spinning up a new repository, picking a license that they liked, and because uh, there are no guidelines, no policies, they just pick a license, and then maybe contributing back code even in the evenings outside of the working hours. I mean, we had a lot of examples this way, which from one side are okay-ish, I would say, because you're saying, okay, your company, someone in the company knows something about open source, right? And they're trying to act, which is good. On the other side, it's kind of uh, scary because no one was aware of this, right? So it was not coordinated. There was not a strategy to move forward. And then point number three, I think is the most interesting one on a company uh, perspective, because when you do these kind of actions and they, you treat them as one-off activities, because you know um, someone was doing a pull request in their free time or someone was picking a random license, what you're doing is basically uh, you're not channeling the energies to have an impact. So all these actions had very limited and minimal impact, which is something that we don't want to have in our strategy. Um, okay, now we have a strategy that tells us, okay, we have a maturity model. We are here in the maturity model. We want to go there. Amazing. How do we do it? Especially considering the fact that all the OSPO of the company is in front of you right now. So we had to be, okay, we told us, we've been saying, let's go agile, let's be lean, let's be able to go in a synchronous way, let's be a one-stop shop where people can just stop by, ask you a question, and eventually get answer. But how does it work on a day-to-day -day basis? So I came up with this little framework here that helps me undergoing all the activities and helps me keeping um, all the company on the same page when we're dealing with OSPO. So we start with engagement. We generate awareness inside a company. We run small talks. We talk with people at the coffee bar. Uh, we, you know, we, from the bottom up, we start to talk with people. We start to create a sense of necessity. So that, especially starting with the low hanging fruit, so the people that already collaborated the, with some open source project, the people that already knew something, the examples I gave you before, they start to ask questions in their mind and say, okay, probably the license I picked randomly the other night was not the best one. Or probably um, I should have thought twice before just going and sign that CLA, right? Um, because, you know, uh, that, that couldn't, 
could have could probably resu result in a, in an issue someday. So now they just don't ask their question on their mind, but they come up with a question with the OSPO and they just pick up the phone or send an email and say, hey, OSPO, whatever you are, please help me. I did this. How should I handle that? So, you know, it's something that generates from the bottom up and people start asking questions and start having this sense of necessity. And then, of course, what we want to do is provide them, again, not operating as an oracle that knows everything and solve every issue, we want to provide them links to our knowledge base, which are build, we were building on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's like, okay, you did this, great. Now, take a look at all the materials we have, because it may you know, help you, maybe not repeating the error, if it was an error, or maybe fix it before it becomes something uh, worse. So our knowledge base goes on and on and on, and then people start to read it start to learn it and then of course at some point they say okay i did my homework i learned whatever i could now please help me so now we are in the phase of active support of course at that point the ospo comes into action and tries to solve the issue involving other people around and um g and e the last two steps are fundamental here because again the ospo at the scale it is right now but i think that also in in bigger um, companies where the OSPO has m more people um, should never be a bottleneck. Because in our case, the, the product teams are end-to-end -end owners of what they do. Like from the very beginning, designing phase to the very end, deployment and operations. So imagine if they have some sort of issues and then they have to involve the OSPO, which is an external entity, from, from, from their point of view, and they assign tasks to the OSPO, and that tasks become bottlenecks, right? They, they become something that they cannot control, and they're not owner on top. That may become a disaster, specifically if you scaled it up into many different products and many different um, projects. So we don't want to create this bottleneck. We want to involve people as much as possible from the very beginning, but keeping in mind that the team is the owner end-to-end. -end. Of course, at some point, we have to talk about value. Uh, we've been dealing with the maturity model. Um, what is the value? The added value that each of these steps in the maturity model provide to the company? That's a good question. I'm really not happy about this plot. I've been iterating over it for, for forever, and uh, I'm still not happy <laughs> on the final result because, you know, over here you can see, okay, we got the five steps of the maturity model. You start with use, repeat, and contrib, which are kind of clustered around the idea of being more tech and legal driven. And then at some point you reach four and five, which are more business driven, and they kind of, if you look at the ratio between value and effort, Four, it's okay-ish, and then five, it's great, right? So the value, you, you, you provide more value to the company than the effort you're putting inside. However, it is, when I presented this to, to many people, uh, you know, running workshop inside a company, the, the feelings were a little bit mixed because they said, okay, but so why don't we just do five, right? Why don't we just cross everything else? Why should we even bother about everything else? So, I mean, this graph, this plot doesn't provide you the idea of uh, the, I don't know, I would call it like compounding interest or compounding effect. I mean, to reach five, you really must do, must go through one to four, right? You cannot just jump there because it means that you need to have the level of maturity to be able to lead an open source project and be there, right? And uh, so maybe, and I tried it as well, we could imagine a pyramid, right? Where, where one, two, three lays, lay on the, um, on the foundation, and then the more you uh, grow, uh, the more you, you reach value. However, probably a 3D map, I don't know, probably if you have feedback, I'll be around and you can give me on this because it's, uh, it's a challenge. Um, anyway, lessons learned. There are a few of them, and uh, again, trying to summarize in three. And this is something that I haven't had the chance of um, learning from any book or any literal blog post, whatever it's out there. So every time you read about OSPO, 
there's a suggestion from someone saying, yes, Ospo, I know it all. Just come to me, I'll tell you what to do, I'll tell you where to put it. Okay, but that doesn't work in my company. That doesn't work in my ecosystem. Uh, okay, now, so you can change. You can put it somewhere else, right? And um, call it another way, pick other people and put it there. But it doesn't work. And so on and on and on. And, and, and we kept having this conversation and kept having this issue. So for us, what is working right now is trying to have a lean approach. Of course, we are one FTE. And what I mean one FTE, I mean, it's me and then some legal counsels that some sometimes we form a team and we try to solve an issue. And then sometimes we also have a software engineer, but it's not, you know, a stable um, three, three FT team. So we, we keep it lean and we try to evolve as the company evolves, which is for me, one of the major finding here. And then the second step is about scale. Again, if you start small, and that's something I've seen around in many companies, starting as a one person uh, um, journey or a couple of them, you really need to scale using tools and automation. To me, it's impossible in the very beginning to scale with people. So if you think about, okay, I have a, a lot of issues, let's um, get five lawyers uh, on the same table and let's try to find every so possible solution at the very same moment, that's going to be very costly. I mean, that's going to cost a lot for a company and I'm not sure it will provide the exact value over time. So try to scale at the beginning with tools and automation, specif specifically if you're going through a compliance, you know, checklist. And then the last part is that it, OSPOs must evolve over time. I think this is the key here because if you think about it, and I'm going going back a little bit in this maturity model, the OSPO you need in, in step number one is definitely different from the OSPO you need in step number three, and it's different from the OSPO you need in step number five, right? Because in number one, you would need what we can call a compliance OSPO, something that helps the company define the policies, the guiding policies, and helps define the tools so that we can iterate and become better users. But then when we want to contribute, we want to have people in our OSPO on board that are able to know what a community is, that are able to know and recognize when a maintainer is burning out, that are able to know how to deal with finance and, you know, channel money and uh, not just throwing money to the problem, but understanding if money could be a solution for that maintainer or not. I mean, we had conversation with a maintainer saying, hey, we could provide some money. And he said, okay, cool. If you give me that money, I'm going to go on vacation. And, you know, maybe in two years, I'll be, I'll be back. And he said, no, we need that PR fixed now, right? You know, that patch. So, you know, throwing money at the, at the, uh, at the problem at that, in that case was not the real solution. So, Again, this is something we should think about as a community, I think, especially in the OSPO world. The idea that we must adapt and the OSPO has to change as soon as the overall maturity of the company for what concerns open source rises, you know, increases. And, uh, and this is something that kind of no one tells you, I believe. And then I'm going to finish with some challenges that we see as OSPO uh, in our company, in Pago Pia. Um, so they say that the culture is what happens in the room when you leave it, right? So in my company, I believe that, uh, and I would like to see that the company and the colleagues are able to sustain a free and open source software discussion to be in the ecosystem, even when the OSPO leaves the room, right? When we're not having a conversation directly with them, they know they are aware, they are engaged they know what we're talking about. If we reach that maturity, it means that we are actually doing a great job. And it actually means that the OSPO maybe is not needed anymore or can be scaled down at some point, right? So eventually, if the OSPO does a good job, it could be shrinked and reduced. It means that it did a good job. And then, of course, we need to intensify co-development and co, not just development, design, co-creation, co yeah, development eventually, right? So involving people and creating a community, a community of practice inside um, our company and outside. So bridging the gap, the OSPO bridges the gap. 
And eventually, if you do that, we will reach maturity level number five, which means lead. So we would be able to be called, let's say, free and open source software champions. And this is something that is really interesting in the Italian ecosystem, especially when we are talking about government, because we really want to see something more happening, more um, ignition of innovation in this field. So we, as a very young company, five years, as I told you before, are trying to disrupt this um, this level, but again, if we treat software the same or outside and inside the government ecosystem as the law right now provides, then there is space also for us and also for other free and open source software um, companies and ventures in this sphere. So that was it. If you have questions, I'll be also around for the next few days. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about like the, the huge growth in the, in the last few years? Do you think it was uh, only a disadvantage because obviously then you have lots of more young or more junior developers, or do you think uh, it wasn't too bad because uh, it's it's easier to teach uh, the younger something? Okay. Thanks. So the question is, uh, how do I feel and how the company feels about the huge, let's say, explosion in the in the pa in the past few years? on, uh, I believe, in, in open source and in, in development sphere in general. And if it's a challenge to, you know, keep uh, uh, the more junior people on board or not. Well, I think, uh, again, is everything, it's, um, it's a challenge, of course, but I can tell you what happens with our junior developers, especially, but not just developers, also, you know, product owners and technical project manager when they join the company. And I think that it's, um, th they're more exposed to free and open source, even without knowing it, than it was before, probably. Uh, so they kind of, when they join, it, they, they kind of have their own sort of GitHub, GitLab, whatever um, repository, even if they don't really care about it that much, but they are used to import libraries, import frameworks, use SDKs, even if they don't really know what they're doing, but they are used to it. So let's say the first step, again, as I told you before, inside, you know, moving the inertia uh, of uh, a company that has always been proprietary is not a, was not a problem for us, probably also with the uh, let's say young generation of developer, this is something a little bit easier because they're already using, used to use that kind of framework. You just have to explain them what this is all about, right? It, you have to explain them that when they import star, whatever they do, that's a dependency, a third party dependency that you're bringing inside a company. And that's something that you have to rely. And do you, it, it's the question of owning uh, and respecting your so software supply chain, right? Something that you get to learn as much as you probably do some mistakes, but as much as you uh, use it. So if you're already used to this kind of ecosystem, like importing and using tools, and I would say 100% of the developers nowadays are, if they are, let's say, serious developers, then it's about, you know, teaching and providing them um, some learning path. So this is something we are doing, right? And uh, of course, it is a challenge. It's not straightforward. And it doesn't get, I mean, no one in university teaches you this, at least not in Italy, which is a pity, I would say. But again, it's something that from the very beginning, at least inside our company, we are able to provide you as a learning path, right? So know where you are, know the ecosystem, know what you're doing. It's great to import STAR and be up and running in a minute with your POC, that's great. But then what happens next? Who's gonna, you know, pay those maintainers or who's gonna support those maintainers or who's gonna um, patch that software if we find a CVE or a vulnerability, right? So uh, this is something I think that uh, it's not impossible. It's something we could do. Um, we're not scared of it. It's part of the process, part of the job. And, uh, uh, and that's, something that the OSPO has to do, right? If, if you don't want to call it OSPO, we, we heard in the past few days, someone call it center of excellence for open source, someone call it um, 
a set of people that like to talk about open source, whatever in the company, right? But just, you know, try to have the leverage and, and reach the internal HR and internal people um, and talk about it inside the company. That's the first step of engage, right? Generate engagement, generate awareness. That's what we're doing as well. Thank you for the question. Yeah, please. How do you cooperate with the SME? Okay. Uh, the question is, how do we cooperate with SME? That's a very good question. Um, on different levels. Uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, overall, the idea is to create community of practices, which means exchanging information. I mean, generally, from the definition of community practice, you may say, okay, an exchange of information. Well, we have several examples. Probably the best one is... Uh, a set of projects, because it's not a product, but a set of different projects where we have um, a governing board. So we have the members inside the governing board. The end result is an AGPL v3 uh, product. So let's say it's a OSI and FNSF compliant license, but we have a governing board that we are able to evaluate external uh, contributions. So pull requests that pop up, uh, happen to be discussed on this governing board, we try to um, publish as much as possible, not just the code, but every documentation file, every information, and also for what concerns the artifacts, let's call it that way, that come out from this discussion. So that's an example that I think we should um, really focus on and also specify more of this and you know involve more more uh, SMEs in this process. Because at the end, SMEs are, as you saw, the integrators of our platform. So it is right that we expose APIs, we expose many of them, but if no one is able to use them, it's not in a, I mean, you're, 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 you're useless, but not just use them. I mean, co-creation means not just reacting to an issue, but means involving them in from the very beginning of the process so that you don't have to react because you already know that the, that feature request is something that we discussed with the community members and with the governing board so you know it's it's a long process process it involves many different pieces of the company but now the ospo is getting i mean it's giving it the shape so it's in on our strategies we know that we want to reach that point where co-creation is part of the of the process. I hope replied. Thank you very much for your for your attention. Have a good day.